Sunlight pierced the cold blue water, and beneath the rippling surface, something enormous moved, slow, deliberate, and begging to be found. How sound lay in its early September stillness, where the mountains of British Columbia sank into the sea like broken teeth, world above hummed with fairy horns and gulls. But below the surface there was only the rhythm of breath, the kind that belongs to those who know how fragile time is when measured in oxygen. Mark Anderson drifted downward, fins slicing the clear water, his camera harness pressing against his ribs. For ten years, he had captured what most people never saw, the silent, merciless beauty of the Pacific Northwest. He had filmed octopuses changing color like living dreams. Forests of kelp had moved with the tides like slow fire. But today, as the first shafts of sunlight turned the water into liquid glass, something felt different, heavier, more awake, as if the ocean itself was watching. At 12 degrees Celsius, the cold was sharp enough to bite. The sea floor appeared 30 meters below, rippled with pale sand and lined with columns of rock draped in emerald kelp. He moved through the silence, steady, methodical, camera rolling, capturing starfish sprawled across stone. Then, a flicker, a disturbance in the water, subtle, deliberate. He paused mid-stroke. The current shifted in a pattern that wasn't random. He felt it in the hairs on his neck. Something big was near. A seal, maybe or a small pot of orcas. But when he turned, expecting to find sleek black shadows, he saw instead a shape too broad, too still. A young humpback whale, perhaps four meters long, hovered in the green-blue haze. Mark's heart hit the back of his throat. The creature's eyes locked on him, black, glassy, but almost human in their pleading. It moved awkwardly, twitching as if torn between curiosity and panic. Dash, not the graceful rhythm of a healthy whale, but jerky, hesitant, wrong. It circled him once, twice, then darted forward, close enough for him to see scratches across its flank. Then it veered off, stopped twenty meters away, and looked back, waiting. Mark felt it immediately, the message. A call not of fear, but of need. He followed. They swam through the still water. Deeper into the sound, the light dimmed, the blue turning into the color of old glass. The whale led, pausing every few lengths, glancing back as if to ensure he was keeping pace. Mark's breath echoed in his mask. A metronome of heartbeats. He checked his gauge. Air good, depth manageable. Still, his mind swam faster than his body. What was this creature leading him toward? Five hundred meters from shore, the seabed dipped into a narrow valley. And there, lying motionless on the sandy bottom, was something that froze his blood. Another whale, larger, immense, barely moving, its flank crusted in a gray, alien mass. He swam closer. It wasn't stone. It was life. Thousands upon thousands of barnacles and sea acorn shells fused to the whale's body. Thick as armor, suffocating its skin, the creature's breathing came in slow, tortured gusts through its blowhole, bubbles rising weakly, its eye half open, followed him with the dim awareness of something that had suffered too long. The young whale circled its mother, brushing her side, nudging her as if to wake her from a terrible dream. Mark felt his chest tighten. His hand went to the knife on his belt. Instinct, not reason. He knew what this meant. Parasites on this scale didn't thrive on healthy skin. This whale was dying. He hovered beside her, bubbles bursting softly above. The barnacles were fused thick, some larger than his fists, layers upon layers of calcified shells. He touched one felt its coarse texture, then pressed his blade beneath. It resisted, clung stubbornly to the whale's flesh when it came loose. A trail of blood clouded the water, swirling red into blue. 
a calf groaned a low, trembling vibration that rattled through Mark's bones. He worked carefully, carving away patches of the suffocating crust, each movement costing hair, each cut revealing new agony. The whale barely stirred, except for a slow closing of her eye, not fear, but surrender. His gauge beeped, air dwindling, thirty minutes gone. He had to surface, he looked at the calf once more. It hovered beside its mother, still watching him, body trembling. The communication was wordless, but absolute. Don't leave her. When he breached the surface, the world above seemed deafening. The wind tore across the sound, gulls crying overhead. But all he could hear was his own racing pulse. He hauled himself onto the boat, ripped off his mask, and reached for the radio. This is Mark Anderson. Certified diver, he said, voice breaking between breaths. I've found a humpback in critical condition, covered in barnacles. Barely breathing, there's a calf with her. How sound? About a mile east-northeast of the inlet. Please, send rescue. The voice that answered was calm, professional, older. Copy that. Mark, hold position. We'll dispatch a marine mammal rescue vessel. ETA one hour. One hour. He drifted on the boat, staring at the water, feeling time stretch like wire. Below him, an entire world fought for one creature's survival. Every few minutes he slipped his mask back on and dipped below. Watching, praying, the calf no longer darted nervously. It had understood. Help was coming. When the rescue vessel arrived, a white catamaran bristling with equipment. The water turned busy with fins and bubbles. Six people moved like surgeons in slow motion. Two marine veterinarians, three rescue divers, and a specialist in crustaceans. Mark joined without hesitation. They descended together, halos of bubbles spiraling upward, lights cutting through the murk. The team surrounded the dying giant, attaching inflatable pontoons and hydraulic scrapers. The sound of metal against shell reverberated like distant thunder. Mark's camera rolled, not for art, but for evidence. Hour by hour, the armor peeled away. Beneath, the whale's skin was pale and raw, marbled with lesions. Dr. Chun's voice crackled through the cums. She's not responding well. Toxic infiltration. Maybe secondary infection. We need to surface samples. Mark swam closer, collected fragments of barnacle, and a clump of synthetic fiber tangled near the whale's pectoral fin. It shimmered faintly nylon, coated with something oily. He bagged it tagged it, and rose to the surface. By nightfall, the whale was buoyed upright in a rescue sling, the calf still circling nearby. The sun burned out behind the coastal mountains, leaving the sound silver and silent. Mark sat on the deck, wrapped in a thermal blanket, staring at the sample bag in his hand. The label read, Source Unknown, Possible Industrial Material. He didn't know it yet. But that small, dark fragment was about to expose a truth far larger than the ocean itself. Morning broke over Hao Sound like a slow awakening. The water gleamed silver under a low sky, calm but heavy as if holding its breath. The rescue vessel rocked gently in the tide. Mark stood at the rail, fingers numb from the cold night, eyes fixed on the horizon that had swallowed the sun only hours before. Somewhere beneath him, life still clung to a fragile thread. The lab team arrived with portable equipment, setting up a makeshift workstation on deck. Dr. Chun, a small woman with steel-gray hair and eyes that rarely blinked, examined the sample Mark had brought up. She placed the tangled nylon under a handheld microscope, her brow tightening. This isn't just debris, she murmured. It's an industrial trawl net. Look here, see the coating? She scraped the surface with a scalpel, releasing a faint chemical scent that stung the air. Tributalton, banned two decades ago. It's one of the most toxic antifouling agents ever made. 
used to stop barnacle growth on ship hulls, and now it's killing whales. Mark's throat went dry. The ocean had always seemed endless, invincible. But this, this was the wound beneath its surface. Human fingerprints pressed deep into the flesh of the sea. Can it be treated? He asked quietly. Dr. Chun shook her head. Not easily. The compound dissolves in fat tissue, poisons the blood, shuts down the immune system. Those barnacles weren't the problem. They were the symptom. The poison weakened her, made her defenseless. The truth fell like lead between them, around the deck. The rescue crew moved with the silent precision of soldiers in a losing war. The whale floated below in the sling, her massive eye half open, surrounded by streaks of pink where skin had been stripped bare. The calf stayed close, brushing its mother's flank with gentle insistence, as if reminding her to keep breathing. By midday, the decision was made. The whale would be transported to the Marine Mammal Rehabilitation Center near Vancouver. It was a risk, a long tow across uncertain waters. But without surgery to remove the poisoned material, she would die within days. The crew inflated pontoons and began the slow, deliberate operation. The calf followed faithfully, never straying more than a few meters. Mark filmed everything, the hydraulic arms lifting, the ropes tightening, the glistening body rising like a wounded god from the deep. Each frame was a testament to the line between survival and extinction. Hours passed. The sound stretched behind them like a mirror cracked with light. Every so often, the calf surfaced beside the toll line, spouting small jets of mist into the air, a rhythmic, fragile signal that echoed across the water. At dusk, the convoy reached the rehab center. Floodlights bathed the docks in white, illuminating a basin where marine veterinarians waited in waist-deep water. The sling lowered gently. The whale's body slid into the pool with a muted splash. Sensors and sailing lines already prepared. Inside the observation room, Mark watched through the glass as Dr. Chun and her team began the procedure. The monitor screens flickered with data, oxygen levels, pulse, toxins. For a moment, all seemed stable. Then the readings began to drop. She's crashing. Someone shouted dot dash Dr. Chun's voice cut through the chaos. Get me suction. We're doing this now. Through the glass. Mark saw them insert the probe deep into the whale's abdomen guiding it toward the stomach. The monitor showed a distorted image, twisted strands of synthetic fiber, compacted into a dark mass. When it finally came free, the lab filled with a sharp chemical odor. They placed the object on a tray. Was the size of a human torso, a knot of fishing net, and rope soaked in oil. The smell was acrid. Dr. Chun peeled back a strand with her gloved hand revealing a faint reddish sheen. See this? That's the anti-fouling agent. Whoever made this net treated it illegally. This stuff is outlawed across the developed world, but someone's still manufacturing it. Her voice hardened. It's a chemical time bomb, and she swallowed it. Mark leaned closer to the glass. On the monitor, he could see the toxin levels slowly decreasing as the whale's blood was filtered. He whispered to himself, She's fighting. The surgery lasted four hours. Outside, the night deepened. Fog curling over the basin. Mark stayed until dawn, camera forgotten. Hands pressed against the cold glass. At sunrise, Dr. Chun emerged. Her face streaked with exhaustion, but lit by the faintest smile. She made it through, she said. Barely. But she's alive. The calf swam beside the enclosure gate. As if it already knew, days turned into weeks. The mother whale's skin began to heal, the raw patches fading to silver gray. The barnacle scars remained like constellations. A record of suffering etched in living flesh, Mark visited daily, cleaning the tanks, checking sensors, documenting the progress. He no longer filmed for broadcast 
only for memory. Sometimes, at dawn, when the facility was quiet, he would lean against the railing and watch the whales through the still water. The calf had grown bolder, breaching playfully, while the mother moved slowly but with renewed grace. You know, Dr. Chan said one morning, joining him with a mug of tea, what happened here will change policy. We've traced the chemical signature back to suppliers in Southeast Asia. It's proof of an international dumping ring. You helped expose it. Mark didn't answer. He was watching the whales. The mother turned slightly, and for a moment, her eye broke the surface, a dark mirror that caught the rising sun. It wasn't me, he said quietly. It was her. She asked for help. I just listened. Three weeks later, the gates of the rehabilitation pool opened. The water beyond glistened gold under a clear October sky. Dozens of people gathered along the shore, scientists, reporters, fishermen, children, their breath misting in the cold air. Mark stood on the deck of the small escort boat. Camera steady. For a long moment, the whales didn't move. They hovered near the threshold, as if uncertain that freedom was real. Then, in perfect unison, they slipped forward. The calf surfaced first, releasing a small plume of mist. The mother followed, her massive body breaking the water with solemn grace. As they reached open sea, both turned and leaped. Two colossal arcs of motion, suspended in sunlight, cascading back into the ocean in an end. Explosion of foam and sound. The crowd gasped. Mark's hands shook as he filmed. It felt less like farewell and more like gratitude made visible. The waves settled. The horizon swallowed their silhouettes. Months passed. Winter blanketed the coast in gray. Mark continued his work with the rescue center. Now as a full-time volunteer, his photographs, once celebrated for their beauty, became tools for education. Their captions no longer about art, but survival. The footage of the rescue went viral across the world. It aired on news networks, in environmental summits, in classrooms. It sparked debates, policies, and investigations into the illegal trade of treated fishing nets. But Mark rarely watched it. For him, the story was not about exposure. It was about silence. The moment the sea had spoken, and he had chosen to listen. Every spring, when the humpbacks returned to British Columbia, Mark took his boat out to the edge of Howe Sound. He'd cut the engine, let the water go still, and wait. Some days, there was nothing but wind others. He'd see distant spouts rising like smoke signals against the horizon. One morning, as dawn cracked over the mountains, he heard it below resonant blow of a whale's breath at another. Two, he lifted his camera. Far ahead, a pair of silhouettes moved in tandem, one large, one smaller, their backs gleaming under the morning sun. They lingered near the boat for nearly an hour, circling, surfacing, diving again. The calf, no longer a calf now, but a strong young whale rushed close enough for Mark to see the faint scar along its mother's side, a white line against dark skin, the mark of survival. When they finally turned toward the open sea, Mark lowered his camera. He didn't need proof. He had witnessed a miracle, one the world had almost missed. The sound was quiet again. Only the soft rhythm of the tide remained. He closed his eyes, feeling the water rock beneath him. And for the first time in years, the silence did not feel empty. It felt alive. 